Thanks to its zero tolerance for COVID-19 cases, China was the only major economy to grow in 2020. While the rest of the world battled wave after wave of coronavirus, China's sealed borders, rigorous testing, and strict quarantine policies enabled life to proceed largely as normal. However, the emergence of the highly contagious Omicron variant and its substrains has the potential to change all that. So how long can China maintain its strict COVID policies? And what matters most to the Chinese government? China has gone to great lengths to keep COVID-19 at bay. After the original strain of the virus ripped through Wuhan at the end of 2019, the national government adopted one of the world's strictest approaches to tackling the pandemic. Until recently, this strategy was extremely successful. It kept case numbers down and national pride up. The success of that strategy in sustaining extremely low level of infection in comparison to the failure of the liberal democracies, including the United States, in handling the COVID outbreaks that convinced the central leaders that uh, this is not just a success of the uh, zero COVID strategy. It could be used to showcase the superiority of Chinese political system, right? So in a way, it's sort of like a projection of China's softer power. But in March of 2022, China faced a major outbreak in its largest city, Shanghai, a financial hub with a population of 26 million people. COVID-19 cases skyrocketed, and the city was locked down in April. Shanghai's outbreak is the biggest since Wuhan 2020. So just in terms of case numbers, it by far exceeds anything we've seen since then. Shanghai is China's most international city. It's a hub of manufacturing. So the impact on global supply chains could be quite substantial. CNBC reporter Evelyn Cheng covered the outbreak from Beijing. Shanghai is usually upheld as one of the most organized places in China. The level of disorganization, the lack of preparedness, and even you know, how they're trying to organize distribution of vegetables, I mean, this is really uncharacteristic of Shanghai. In Shanghai, most people are being sent to these quarantine centers where reports say it's very cold or there's no showers and very primitive. The lockdown forced many factories to shut while well, some opted to stay open by using a closed-loop system. This is essentially a bubble, like the ones China used to host the Winter Olympics in Beijing. Workers are tested frequently and can't leave the area unless there is an emergency. For factory workers, that meant sleeping on the factory floor. A lot of the factories are located in industrial parks in sort of the suburban parts of major cities. So if you have all your workers on site, and that site is basically cut off from the neighboring towns, then you can keep on producing on that site. Otherwise, Shanghai residents were confined to their homes. Struggling to get food and other basic items due to logistics and supply chain issues, residents turned to group buying. This is when a group of people get together, often in the same residential compound, to buy groceries and other daily essentials in bulk. So the world began to wonder, could the outbreak in Shanghai force the end of China's no tolerance policy? While the language has changed somewhat, with talk of a dynamic zero COVID approach, analysts tell me there's been no fundamental change in strategy. They are fundamentally the same. We thought that well, this is going to signal there's some significant relaxation of the zero COVID strategy. Turn out we were wrong. So why is China so reluctant to abandon its policy? Well, easing restrictions bears major risks. Leadership in Beijing is bent on avoiding a situation like the one in Hong Kong, where the Omicron variant ripped through the densely populated financial center and overwhelmed the healthcare system. Hong Kong was absolutely a cautionary tale for the mainland leadership about worst case scenarios for what an outbreak would look like on the mainland. When hospitals become overloaded, it can create quite ugly scenes, quite chaotic scenes that mobilize public anger and undermine confidence in the government. 
Thanks in part to China's zero tolerance policy, the country is now uniquely vulnerable to the virus. Because fewer people were exposed to COVID, China's population boasts lower immunity from natural infection than other parts of the world. On top of that, China has relied on homegrown vaccines from Sinopharm and Sinovac, which offer little protection against infection from Omicron. And the vaccination rate among China's elderly population is worryingly low. The concern is that if the China open up, well, the healthcare system will be overwhelmed by a surge of the cases, you know, and that would be dangerous politically and epidemiologically. Even though China's existing vaccines provide better protection against severe disease, the sheer scale of China's population means thousands would likely require hospitalization. Its public health infrastructure and ICU capacity remain inadequate to respond to a surge in cases too. Its number of intensive care beds per 100,000 people is just a fraction of other major economies. That's even worse in rural areas. Doctors also lack the practical experience that Western peers have after two years of treating patients with the virus. China could focus on a new vaccination campaign to boost immunity. Chinese companies are racing to develop their own mRNA vaccine, but it remains to be seen when and if a new shot will be ready. Alternatively, China could look to deploy the mRNA vaccines used in the West. At this point, I think it's quite clear that politics and nationalism have played a role in delaying the Chinese government's approval of foreign vaccines. And it now looks unlikely that they would grant approval to those vaccines, at least until a Chinese homegrown vaccine is on the market. But China's commitment to zero COVID has economic costs. Its people are buying less, supply chains have been disrupted, and investors are leaving the Chinese market in droves. This issue of the pandemic response has been so politicized when it's used to showcase the superiority of the Chinese political system, when it's framed as a competition between liberal democracy and the authoritarian system, these political stakes become so high, the economic cost becomes secondary. The idea of avoiding scenes of chaos is a key consideration for the leadership, perhaps even more so than reducing case numbers or ensuring that no one dies. And I think that's why the zero COVID policy remains in effect. Most experts agree that the real milestone to watch is the 20th National Congress of the Chinese Communist Party, due to take place at the end of 2022. Changing policy at this point would inject potential instability in the months leading up to this party Congress. The party is preparing for the leadership transition you know, that is expected to occur in the 20th Party Congress. They don't want any surprise you know, that derail the transition, that undermine President Xi's leadership. As for the Chinese public, they've been mostly supportive of Beijing's zero-tolerance approach. It was a source of national pride for Chinese people that case numbers have been so low throughout the last two years in a period when COVID has ravaged much of the rest of the world. It was also advantageous from an economic perspective because China was able to maintain production and in some cases gain export market share while other countries suffered shutdowns. But could food shortages, a struggling health system, and controversial policies like separating COVID positive children from their parents in Shanghai change that? Despite all this discontents, dissatisfactions on the zero COVID strategy. The overall public support for that strategy remains strong, especially in smaller Chinese cities or in the countryside where people have only limited access to alternative information. There's a sense that public opinion may be shifting and the hardships we've seen in Shanghai, whether it's people having trouble getting grocery deliveries whether it's the extreme lack of freedom that people are suffering now, entering in some cases more than 20 days in complete lockdown in Shanghai, it's wearing on people's nerves. The official figures show that deaths have been very, very low in Shanghai, although there's reason to distrust the official figures, but I think it still gives a broad indication of the seriousness 